Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm pleased to be joined uh, again today, uh, again, because these conversations with him are always so valuable, with, uh, by Eric Edelman, um, counselor at the uh, Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, uh, Professor Johns Hopkins Sice here in Washington, but more importantly for our purposes, someone who served with distinction at very high levels of the State Department, the Defense Department, the White House, uh, historian as well. So someone who's really terrific at giving us a big picture, but also with proper attention to details of what's happening in the world. So I thought we should talk again about Ukraine, Eric. We talked on March 1st, and uh, that conversation, I look back at it, stands up quite well, actually, but we should talk about how things have changed, right? Well, when we we talked uh, at the outset, it was clear that Putin's plan to launch a decapitation strike uh, to exercise regime change uh, very quickly and brutally in Ukraine was failing. Uh, And so it was a a kind of optimistic moment. And, you know, here we are three months later and uh, the Ukrainians are are still fighting. Ukraine is still standing and the Russian military is in some trouble. But the, I think, long-term prognosis is a little murkier. Okay, so let's go through that. But that's what I was going to say, you know, yeah, it was, we were both inspired. That was a week into the war we spoke and Ukraine had been, it was clear that Zelensky, the initial Russian thrust seemed to have failed to decapitate the regime and Zelensky and the Ukrainians were fighting courageously and impressively, obviously. And uh, we were hopeful, I think, concerned about what might happen though over the medium and long term. So here we are, what, three and a half months later. So what should we do? Let's go through sort of the military situation, perhaps, and 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 what we're doing there, but most of what they're doing, and then diplomacy, and then economics. A lot to talk about. So, what, what's your where, where's your read? We're speaking on what is it, June twenty second? Uh, where are we, sort of militarily, and uh, what do you what do you think the prospects for the near term are? So, the military situation um, has. Uh, evolved in a way in which uh, the weaknesses of the Russian military, particularly its poor logistics uh, because of the corruption, which uh, I think has eaten the Russian military from the inside out. It's every military is uh, to some degree a microcosm of society at large. Russia's enormously corrupt society under Putin. Uh, The military is no exception. Um, And as a result of that, they've had to pull back from Kiev. They've had to pull back from Kharkiv. Uh, Although they continue to, you know, shell just um, uh, over the last several days, they've been shelling Kharkiv, even though the Ukrainian forces have pushed the Russians away. And what the Russians appear to have done after taking enormous um, losses, both in uh, personnel and materiel over the last three months, hundreds and hundreds of tanks, uh, thousands of of, uh, Russian troops, Uh, easily more than they lost in the 10 years of their war in Afghanistan, uh, and and maybe perhaps as high as double that, according to some some estimates. Uh, It's very hard to, of course, be certain about what exactly what the losses are. Um, But they have now doubled down uh, and attempted to hang on to what they seized in the south uh, along the coast uh, from Mariupol on down uh, towards Odessa. Um, and in particular, trying to seize all of the Donbas, the two provinces, Lugansk and Donetsk, um, that were destabilized by Putin using proxy forces back in 2014 and 15, but where the uh, line of contact, the battle lines had, had settled in with about a third of each of those provinces controlled by Putin's proxies. He's now pushing uh, and may be able to uh, successfully seize uh, all of Lugansk. Donetsk, I think, will be much, much harder for them because of the lack of personnel uh, that they're suffering from because of all of these losses and their inability to uh, generate uh, additional forces down there. Um, but this all seems to be an antecedent to his making this a fait accompli by um, essentially uh, annexing these territories and making them part of Russia proper. I think that's what most people think he's uh, intending to do. The Ukrainians have um, been slowly forced back in Lugansk, but they're inflicting enormous heavy losses on the Russians. Russian movement has been extremely slow uh, in in doing this. It's been characterized by uh, General Mark Hurtling, a a former U.S. Lieutenant General, good uh, 
very good fellow who I got to know uh, during the uh, Operation uh, uh, Iraqi Freedom as a slugfest, an artillery slugfest, which I think is a pretty good way of, of characterizing it. Um, and in the South, we're beginning to see some Ukrainian counterattacks around Mykolaiv pushing the Russians uh, back a little bit. And, and that is the Ukrainian theory of victory, by the way. It's been outlined in Foreign Affairs by Foreign Minister uh, Kuleba, which is that having inflicted enormous losses uh, on the Russians, um, as additional military equipment comes in from the United States, from other NATO states uh, that allow them to outrange the Russian artillery. Right now, they're outnumbered and outranged by Russian artillery. But if they get these uh, additional systems, the French César, um, some German systems that are being made available, the U.S. HIMARS system, um, maybe perhaps later MLRS, although there's, there's issues with that. But uh, th these kinds of systems, uh, some British systems, will allow the Ukrainians to hit and destroy Russian artillery at greater and greater range, enabling the Ukrainian forces to regroup and uh, counterattack and take back some of the territory. That, according to Minister Kuleba, is the Ukrainian theory of victory. And it's not a bad theory. I think Mark Hurtling, for instance, would uh, agree with it. Um, but there are some other factors that may be at play here. What about, so yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, or where, I guess two questions, uh, maybe uh, first, I mean, are we doing as much as we could be doing? Should we be doing more to increase the odds of that Ukrainian theory of victory, as opposed to a sort of in-between situation of kind of frozen conflict? I guess it would be uh, Russian creeping gains, but then it stalls out, or even Russian progress, because they ultimately bring just much more uh, weight to bear in these artillery, uh, uh, brutal artillery exchanges. I mean, where are how much are we do we and our allies doing could we be doing more is do you think are you worried that the biden administration is self-deterring a little too much or are they mostly getting the stuff there you know adequately i'm just what's your sense yeah it's a great uh, series of questions that you're asking i mean first that we have done the us has done quite a bit um i think we're now uh with the latest announcement of a presidential drawdown of a a billion dollars, some of which is against the $40 billion package that the Congress passed a couple of weeks ago. I think we're now up to $5.6 billion in, in uh, you know, U.S. military assistance to Ukraine since, the, um, since even before the conflict began, going back to the buildup uh, last, last fall and summer. Um, that's not nothing. And my impression is that the Department of Defense uh, when General Milley and uh, uh, Secretary Colin Call, my, my successor several times removed as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, uh, say that they're moving at sort of bureaucratic light speed, <laughs> they are correct when they are, are talking about uh, decisions to transfer equipment. Once decisions have been made, uh, we've been relatively rapid at getting the equipment moved out and and into Ukrainian hands. Um, and that's the Defense Department, really, once the that's, authorization that's, is given. Yeah. That's the Defense Department. You think Department. they're doing pretty well, they're serious, they're not messing around, they're focused. No, I think they're moving very quickly once they get a presidential decision. The presidential decision process, however, in my view, has been a little bit slow. And some of it has, some of that has to do with uh, self-deterrence, some of that has to do with concerns about declining stocks. Some of that has to do with um, concerns about how the Ukrainians might use these weapons. So for instance, with the HIMARS, I think uh, there's been a lot of comment, uh, some of which I agree with actually, that uh, you know, four firing units and you know, 80 rounds or whatever it was that uh, were being offered seemed very much, you know, even with the great precision that HIMAR and the greater range that HIMARS offers, Seemed, seemed a little bit uh, you know, low given the scale of what's going on here. I think there was you know, an effort there to um, have kind of a proof of concept, if you will, because they did want undertakings from the Ukrainians that they wouldn't be striking into Russian territory with these systems, that they'd only be going after the uh, artillery fire aimed at them from, uh, from inside um, the Donbass. Um, 
and uh, that they wanted to see that they were using these very expensive, highly precise uh, munitions rounds uh, with fire discipline and that they weren't just firing these things, you know, off. They do have, I think, some additional firing units pre-positioned. I think they're ready to move them. But in general, I think the pace has been a little bit slower uh, than uh, certainly the Ukrainians would like. And I think uh, than I would like, I think we need to be moving more and moving faster, although we do face and we can come back and talk about that, not just the U.S., but uh, as an alliance, we face some real shortfalls in munitions uh, that you know are very worrisome and which we really need to you know get our, our heads around. And the allies are uh, mostly doing their part well also in terms of both uh, amount of, of weaponry and speed. It, you know, it depends on which allies you are talking about. The Estonians, for instance, I think, I believe this is accurate, uh, are per capita after us, the next largest contributors. Um, the Slovaks are just announcing some additional transfers of, of systems. In general, I think what you're seeing is, um, and this is uh, to some degree, Hegel's uh, cunning of reason at work, you know, uh, Putin wanted to, you know, push NATO further away from Russia's borders. Uh, what's happening, uh, as you know, is uh, with the pending accession of Finland and Sweden, uh, NATO is moving closer to its borders, but also NATO is progressively, the new member states who joined after 1997 are eliminating their stocks of old Soviet era military equipment, uh, which is being funneled into Ukraine and being used by the Ukrainians in the fight, uh, which means when they uh, replenish and resupply themselves, including from the United States, uh, NATO will end up being a more modern, more interoperable, more lethal and more capable force on his doorstep uh, than, you know, than he uh, envisioned when he started this. Yeah, and we'll talk in a minute maybe about Sweden and Finland, which you know some know an awful lot about, having been ambassador to Finland and uh, and their likely accession to NATO, I I suppose. But uh, I'm sure. Do you? There have been some people who said we're being excessively finicky about making sure that it's Ukrainians who are firing every weapon, basically that we have to deliver everything to them. That we are in doing that, we are in effect participants in the war by in a certain way by traditional you know standards uh, and why are we you know if if we need to send if some u.s forces or some nato forces have to go in and be advisors let's just say maybe not literally pull the trigger on these weapons but would it be so terrible if some uh, americans or poles or germans were you know in western ukraine on the spot advising the ukraines i don't think we're doing that right we're being pretty careful to kind of advise them and train them outside of ukraine and we're not in there and that's part of our non-escalation and non-provocation of putin and some of that i'm sure is sensible and one would want to go maybe too far uh but where are you on that do you think it's ne is it necessary to do that maybe if it's not necessary of course why why do it but and also more broadly what about the question of nato forces being engaged and talk a little bit about the blockade which i know you've thought a lot about yeah so look i think uh, there is uh, you know a prudential argument for trying to uh, not allow putin to you know validate his claim uh, that this was a war that nato provoked you know by its actions um I, I, that's not the same thing however as you know saying that we need to um you know be hyper a vigilant about every action we take as a potential, you know, provocation of of Putin. I mean, I, I think we need to put more, and the U.S. government needs to put more effort, not into thinking, trying to put ourselves in his head and figuring out what it is that, you know, we might do that might provoke him to escalate, but rather put in his head concerns about what he's doing that might cause us to escalate. I mean, that's right. the nature, I think, of deterrence and, and of escalation management. And I think the Biden administration has, you know, uh, to a fault been, you know, worried about the escalation uh, risks. Uh, and I think it's important to try and uh, put the escalation monkey on, on Putin's back. And in particular, when it comes to the, the so-called blockade. And one of the other factors that I was talking about earlier that I worry about 
And I think this goes to what Putin's theory of victory is. So we've discussed what the Ukrainian theory of victory is. Putin's theory of victory is uh, really emerging pretty clearly uh, from comments he's made recently um, at the Russian St. Petersburg Economic Forum, which is supposed to be their version of Davos, except that nobody showed up this year, except, you know, some of the Central Asian states. Um, but his theory of victory is that time is on his side, uh, that, that he, is able, he has been able so far to manage the consequences of Western economic sanctions on, on Russia without notable public unrest in Russia, um, that uh, in particular, he is able, and this comes not just from his comments, but those of uh, you know, Russian propagandists on Russian state television, like Margarita Simonyan, that uh, who recently said, you know, uh, the blockade is working, you know, food can't get out, there's going to be famine. And so people understand they have to be our friends, you know, because they are worried about just what the blockade is. So that's the Russians are preventing. The Russians have not declared a blockade. I think it's important to note that, but they've used their Black Sea fleet and the fact that the Ukrainians have mined the uh, port of Odessa, which is the major Black Sea port uh, from which uh, Ukrainian agricultural exports have, have flowed out of the country, uh, to uh, bottle them up uh, and, and keep them from uh, exiting. So there's no official blockade, but de facto Ukraine can't send stuff out on ships. Correct. And right now, I think there's something like 20 million tons of grain in silos in Ukraine waiting, uh, waiting to be exported. The IMF has estimated that we could have as many as 100 million people uh, at risk of food insecurity because of this. There are a lot of countries, including Lebanon, Egypt, uh, any number of others, very heavily dependent on Ukrainian food uh, exports. And Putin is weaponizing this. This is not new, by the way. I mean, you know, Stalin weaponized uh, hunger and food against Ukraine uh, in the 1930s. Um, and he's, he's weaponizing food and the unrest that food insecurity will cause and the migration uh, into Europe that is likely to cause, for instance, from sub-Saharan Africa. So this blockade, I mean, is it worth well, how risky would it be for NATO or uh, to, to intervene? Uh, I take it Ukraine can't do it by itself to get its ex get its food out and get it some economic help for itself as well as for the world in terms of the grain. Uh, how risky would it be for us to, to try to do that? Should we push a little harder on that? Uh, well, it's you know it's not really a blockade uh, under international law, and. So they haven't announced, I mean, there's no there's official... No, there's no official announcement. Well, they've said they're going to block uh, Ukraine from exporting its grain, but they haven't said that this is a blockade, which is an act of war. And since they've been careful to say this is a special military operation, not a war, they, they haven't done so. Um, I, I think uh, there are some negotiations going on, desultory talks between Turkey and Russia about opening uh, up the port. And um, just, I think today they uh, announced they're going to have even more talks. I'm not terribly confident that those will uh, go very far. But I think we need some kind of effort, whether it's a UN sanctioned effort or EU sanctioned effort or a NATO effort, uh, or just the Black Sea states. Uh, you know, there are several member states like Turkey, uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, who could be a part of this. Uh, to escort the ships out uh, of the Black Sea and out to market. Um, and I think there are, you know, ways to, to do that. And I think you put the escalation monkey on uh, Putin's back. I mean, Putin has been saying that, you know, this is uh, the fault of NATO and, and the United States for holding up the food. If you have an effort to escort uh, the food out, you know, let, let him be the one to start trying to sink those ships. Uh, and I, I think that would be a way of putting the escalation monkey on his back. There's been some talk in the administration about trying to do this over land, building silos. President Biden's made some reference uh, to this. But I, I think uh, they're only able to get a certain amount you know, of, of grain out o over land. The rail and road networks are not very good. I don't know how long it's going to take uh, to build the silos that they're talking about. So 
it seems to me that breaking this blockade is actually quite an urgent, uh, urgent requirement. And um, I wish there were more attention to it, in particular because urgent for food for food security elsewhere in the world as well, and food prices probably, but also for Ukraine itself. Exactly. I mean, it's a huge element of Ukraine's economy, and. While we've all been very focused on the military balance and the you know military situation in uh, in the Donbas and in around Kherson and and uh, all of that, which is very important, uh, the larger question to me is how how do both sides sustain this? I mean, we we talked about Putin's theory of victory. His theory is time is on his side. The West will lose interest. The West will lose focus. People will start pushing Ukraine to make a deal. Uh, sanctions will erode, uh, and that the Ukrainian economy uh, will be less well situated to take the hit than the Russian economy. He's talked a lot about having, uh, you know, resisted the sanctions, put in place steps to mitigate their consequences. Uh, the increase in uh, uh, oil uh, prices has uh, essentially given him about a billion dollars a month, maybe 800 million billion a month uh, that allows him to fund the you know, continuing war. And although there are pretty serious um, estimates of how much the sanctions will set back the Russian economy, I think his own central banker, Nabulina, has said it will be 12 percent hit. Uh, others have, have you know, said uh, IMF has said it'll be 15 percent. I've seen estimates from Goldman Sachs and international financial institutions, 30 percent, but the Ukrainian economy is contracting by about 45 percent. And, uh, you know, that's from a lower uh, level than the Russian economy to begin with. So the question here is, you know, we may be facing, um, if you're talking about the kind of artillery slugfest that we mentioned earlier, that's kind of reminiscent of you know, World War One. you may be in a situation of what our friend Elliot Cohen calls uh, you know, question of who collapses first. Um, and uh, there I worry that we're not giving as much attention to the economic side of this uh, conflict as we are the military side. And and the longer this goes, the longer this settles into a war of attrition, that's going to become a, a big concern, I think. Yeah, well, let's raise a couple of very important points. I want to get back to the, the whole economic side a bit, including energy, and then the question of, you know, we're, what if we do let it lapse into a war of attrition uh, four months from now? How worried are we that European resolve starts to fade and so forth? But just on the escalation point to kind of end maybe this military section, mostly, I mean, how generally, you mentioned the blockade, you've written uh, actually on the nuclear question where we seem to have been uh, bending over backwards, maybe it's fair to say, to, to reassure uh, Putin and ourselves for that matter that we wouldn't dare risk any kind of nuclear confrontation, not that we should be risking it, but that we're, we're willing to even, as I say, to do some not stop, not do some non-nuclear things because of the nuclear risk. I guess that's a good way of putting it. We wouldn't touch their soil. We, we won't have advisors. I mean, that whole medley of things, I, I'm, it's too glib to say, oh, we should be doing all these things because there are pretty good reasons and to be careful. And some things probably don't have to be done. But in general, how worried are you about a kind of self-deterrence and excessive worry about escalation and how much do you think that's actually hampering the overall uh, war effort, uh, our ability to help Ukraine? Well, it, it, it is a, a big uh, problem, I think. Um, and, you know, I, look, I, the administration has a difficult task and I don't, you know, gainsay that having you know, been in government myself, managing a large, you know, unwieldy alliance of, you know, uh, 30 nations is, is not an easy task. And so you've got, you know, questions of alliance management, how do you hold all the allies together, you know, et cetera. And if you, if you look as if you're recklessly running risks, that obviously can make it harder to, to manage allies. That being said, though, I think we, we have uh, erred way too much, uh, you know, on the side of uh, caution here. Um, there's been way too much uh, discussion of what we won't do, as opposed to a focus on what we will do and are doing, uh, and what we might do, depending on you know what the Russians do. So on the nuclear piece that you mentioned, my colleague Frank Miller and I noted that President Biden, in his op-ed in the New York Times, had actually said the right things about uh, potential use of a nuclear weapon by 
uh, Putin, which is, you know, some of that talk has receded, thankfully, uh, but it's still out there as a you know potential issue. And uh, President Biden, uh, I think, I can't recall exact uh, words, but I believe it was something like any use of nuclear weapons, uh, which he stressed, we haven't seen any indication that they're getting ready to do, but any use would entail the most severe consequences. That is inappropriate declaratory policy because it um, embodies the admonition of Thomas Schelling, uh, the late Thomas Schelling, the Nobel laureate, who was one of the uh, architects of nuclear deterrence theory in the Cold War, who said that one of the most effective deterrents is ultimately the risk that leaves something to chance. The notion that if the other side pursues a particular course of conduct, the chain of consequences that will result is unpredictable and might lead to unacceptable consequences uh, for, for the initiator. Um, but no sooner was the ink dry on the New York Times column than the senior officials were rushing to tell David Sanger and William Broad of the New York Times, well, if the Russians use nuclear weapons, we would never, you know, ever consider, um, you know, using a, a, a nuclear weapon. And there's a, a recent article in The Atlantic uh, by Eric Schlosser that quotes some senior, former senior officials, including a former Secretary of Defense, saying even if they use two nuclear weapons, we wouldn't use a nuclear weapon. Look, I, I, and wasn't it also that we wouldn't even use conventional for weapons as much as we might in well, Russia and so forth? It, that was sort of indicated, right? Well, I mean, it was we would use conventional response plus diplomacy, et cetera. Right. Look, I, I'm not arguing that necessarily we should use a nuclear weapon if he uses a nuclear weapon. I think a lot will depend on the circumstances and the context and uh, intelligence. So there are a lot of, of things to get back. But, but why anybody would be vocalizing this hmm. uh, when you want him to worry about the risk that leaves something to chance and the ambiguity that has been essential to deterrence is being undermined by this constant leaking and walking back of, of Biden's statements. And so I think, you know, that, that we do have a self-deterrence problem, and I do think it, it merits some uh, message discipline and, uh, you know, on the part of the administration. I mean, administration officials have told me that, in fact, there really is no debate about the fact that there would be severe consequences if there was nuclear use, and they, they haven't made the decision about what they would do, which is appropriate, but they also haven't corrected the record. Um, and I think that le has left things very, you know, very, very muddy. Yeah, and I think what you're also saying, though, is it's not just a messaging issue kind of going forward. We're actually not doing quite what we, as much as we could do, that we're doing a fair amount, to help Ukraine in terms of actual arms, and then, of course, the blockade, even more so, perhaps, uh, because of a great wariness of any kind of direct, not direct involvement, even involvement, in, more NATO involvement that would give Putin an excuse to say, oh, it's, look, they're intervening, even if that intervention was defensive, helping ships get out from port or, or advisors helping a country defend itself against an invasion. Well, let me make, let me, let me extend the point a little bit. Um, we talked earlier about the limitations the administration has put on the Ukrainian use of the, uh, the HIMARS, um, yeah, which is a, essentially a multiple launch rocket uh, system. Um, and it's, it's wheel, unlike the MLRS, which you hear a lot about, uh, which is a tracked vehicle, the HIMARS is a wheeled vehicle, which actually is more useful to the Ukrainians in the terrain that they've got to operate in. But um, the, the limitations the administration has put on them is, you know, don't fire into Russian territory. Now, that's somewhat, I mean, I, you know, I understand the logic behind that, but it's also a little bit crazy. I mean, what's the difference between, you know, uh, firing on uh, you know, Russian artillery pieces a mile inside the border of Donbass and a mile on the other side of the border if they're if they're basically going after artillery that's firing at Ukraine? I mean, I can understand saying you don't want deep strike into Russia the, on civilians that's not associated with war. Okay, fine, but to make this arbitrary border issue you know a sticking point i think is betraying a little bit of an excessive concern for the escalatory uh you know risks um do you feel that the administration's moving slightly away from that excessive concern or is it pretty embedded or getting worse or what, what do you think i i 
you know, I think it's fluctuated a little bit. Um, I think it's actually overall less uh, than it than it was, but I think episodically it kind of pokes up again. Uh, and honestly, I think a lot of it comes from the president himself. Hmm. Interesting. Let's talk a little bit about NATO. You said one of the you know, wars always have surprises. Like you said this in our March 1st discussion and our, other people pointed this out. Things happened that weren't on the table and then they no one quite expected. And certainly one is not is I think both the reasonably strong performance of NATO, uh, but also don't you think the likely accessions of, of Finland and Sweden. So I'm not sure a lot of people have been following that very closely. So say a word about just what does that mean? I mean, the, this was not something that was like imminent two years ago, and now it's just being sped up by a few months, right? This is something that no, was basically not in prospect, right? And is it important? Yeah, so it's a very interesting uh, development. Um, and to give you a, a sense of how rapidly it, it changed, when I was ambassador uh, to Finland in the late 1990s, in the immediate wake of the first post-Cold War enlargement of NATO that took in uh, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. Um, support for NATO membership in Finland was pretty low. It was about 25%, you know, roughly, 20 to 25. And uh, with a majority against. I mean, Finland had been uh, a neutral, uh, non-aligned state throughout most of the Cold War, not by choice, but essentially um, in deference to its very large neighbor, um, Russia, who had invaded Finland in 1939 and fought a, a, a pretty bloody war for several months. And that war in 1941, uh, after the uh, German um, invasion of, of the Soviet Union, renewed itself in the so-called continuation war. So it was a pretty you know, bloody war for both Finland and for, for the Soviet Union. Um, and in the aftermath, uh, Finland was treated um, as a defeated power, uh, even though its collaboration with Germany was you know, forced on it to some degree by the fact that uh, everybody else, despite some promises of support from the West, uh, never materialized uh, to support the Finns against the Soviets. Um, what happened in public opinion after February 24th is really quite astounding. I mean, in the run up to uh, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, public opinion in Finland had sort of ticked up a little bit, and in Sweden. In Finland, it was up around 28%. After February 24th, it went to um, 53%, then it went to 60%. And then it went over 70%. And in the end of the day, of all the political parties in Finland across the board, including the post-communist left party, endorsed um, Finnish membership in NATO. Um, the, the vote was overwhelming in the parliament. Public it, wasn't, it wasn't something any major party really had been pushing very hard prior to that, right? It wasn't like this was like, oh, they were close to coming to a majority. I mean, my impression is both Sweden and Finland, they were pretty happy with their status, which was pretty cooperative with us and with NATO. It wasn't like they were, you know, off there in, in the wilderness, but they were perfectly happy that they've had a long tradition of neutrality in Finland for the reasons you cited, Sweden for slightly other reasons. And there was just no impetus to change the status quo, really. And suddenly Putin changed the status quo and they changed and they look like they're about to change the status quo. Yeah, so it's important, I think, to understand that, uh, you know, Finnish defense white papers going back to the late 90s had always stressed cooperation with, you know, neutrality and non-alignment, but a very close cooperation with NATO. Right. Um, and over the years, that cooperation has grown extremely close. I mean, Finland, uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, made the decision during the Bush 41 administration under then Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney to, to purchase from the United States. Um, F-18 aircraft for, for its modern fighter force. They still fly 62 uh, F-18s, um, uh, some of which were co-produced in Finland uh, with between Boeing and Finnish defense industry. Uh, and they've made the decision to buy a new follow-on fifth generation uh, aircraft, and that will be the F-35. They will have 64 high-performance F-35s in their 
inventory of their Air Force. Um, they were, over the years, arming their F-18s with the uh, JASM, the uh, Joint Attack Surface-to-Surface uh, -surface Missile, um, uh, or uh, Air-to-Surface Missile. Um, and uh, they were the only non-ally to actually have that in their inventory for some period of time. So they've always been close cooperation with NATO. Uh, on January 1st, actually, President Ninisto of Finland, who actually is one of, I think, the few real statesmen in, in Europe right now, um, said, he reminded the country in his presidential address that NATO membership was, was always an option for Finland, uh, that, that, that they had maintained that as part of their uh, national strategy, close cooperation and an option for membership at some point when circumstances change. After February 24th, he concluded, as did a lot of other senior Finns, that circumstances had changed. In Sweden, it was a little bit different. As you said, they've had slightly different uh, reasons for neutrality, and that goes back deeper, goes back a couple of hundred years, not, not just you know 75 years. And uh, there, the turn was not as dramatic in public opinion. Uh, it went up over a majority after February 24th, and the numbers went higher if you asked the question, if we join with Finland, do you agree? That got it up into the 60s. But the Finns and Swedes concerted very closely together and uh, moved, I think, very smartly uh, to, um, to make their application, handle it very well, including with the Russians, I think. Um, and its importance, I think, has been underestimated uh, just where does it stand now just to take a second so they've they've applied for membership there's a nato asked. meeting coming up very soon no there's a nato summit at the end of the month in madrid and, and like of next course, week i think yeah yeah the 28th i believe yeah. and so 28th 29th and so i i um you know it's it's now being held up by objections from turkey now the interesting thing about those objections is that they were not vocalized when President Ninisto called uh, uh, President Erdogan on April 4th, nor in meetings between Foreign Minister um, Havisto of Finland and Chavusholu of Turkey, nor in the multiple uh, consultations, which President Ninisto has described in an interview in the Finnish media between the foreign ministries of the two countries, or in the discussions that were had with Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg of NATO in Brussels. Um, so this is clearly a kind of extortionate diplomacy by Erdogan to try and I've likened it um, in the pages of the dispatch to um, uh, Rod Blagojevich getting a hold of the, you know, opportunity to replace Barack Obama in the in the US Senate. And um, Erdogan, I think, uh, as I was saying, sees himself like Rod Blagojevich. He's got this golden you know, ticket and now he wants to you know, get a price paid for it. Uh, some of that has been uh, has been articulated by the Turks as what they want from the Swedes and Finns on Kurdish nationalism, but um, but I think uh, I think he has other fish to fry. I think he wants FaceTime with President Biden. I think he wants uh, to purchase some F-16s from the United States, advanced F-16s, and so I think that that is you know it's a, an issue as well. Think it'll happen. I think ultimately it'll happen, but but I think that um, that uh, it may require the president to get involved at the Madrid summit, as he had to with Erdogan, as his predecessor Cesar, had to with Erdogan at various NATO summits. And so, say a word about then the significance of Finland and Sweden. Let's just say in in a month or six months or NATO members, and that's 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 good. That strengthens NATO quite a bit, right? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, there's huge bipartisan support in the United States for this. When when President uh, Ninista and uh, Prime Minister Anderson of uh, Sweden were in town together in May, uh, they had not only meetings in the White House with the president and with U.S. national security leaders, but they also brought together um, Leader McCarthy, um, Minority Leader um, McConnell, uh, Speaker Pelosi, and uh, and uh, Majority Leader Schumer. Not that many people can actually convene those four people in one room for me, right. which tells you that there is very good support. And uh, there's been discussion of moving 
the amended treaty rapidly through the uh, ratification process in the U.S. To, main, to minimize the amount of time that Finland and Sweden would be in the waiting room, as it were, and not NATO members. What do they bring to the table? Well, first of all, uh, it's been the case that uh, that uh, reinforcing the Baltics has has been a, a major headache for NATO for some some time. Um, the Baltics are, uh, you know, very isolated, and the uh, the problem and the difference, by the way, between Ukraine and the Baltics is uh, the fight in Ukraine has gone across a front of almost a thousand miles. Um, in the Baltic states, the space is much more compressed, um, and the time that you would have to respond to a Russian military move much less. And so, uh, although the Russian military performance in Ukraine uh, hasn't been you know, very good, and therefore some people I think are inclined to say, well, the threat's not that great. Uh, in the Baltics, it would be potentially a different story, and I think we need to bear that in mind. Finland and Sweden now create a, a sort of strategic hinterland from which it's much easier to reinforce the Baltic uh, because of their control of, of airspace and because they're Baltic literal states. Uh, so their uh, ability, the ability of NATO to control the Baltic, as, as some have said, it will become a NATO lake uh, because Denmark controls the Danish Straits, Finland, uh, Sweden, excuse me, controls Gotland, um, and Finland has a long coast. Um, it would allow you to bottle up the Russian fleet in Kaliningrad and to some degree St. Petersburg. They wouldn't be able to come out very effectively. So, so Putin's generated what he claimed to be worried about. Falsely, probably, you know, years ago for the last several years, right? About NATO expansion. Potentially will be a much more serious military dilemma for for Russia with their uh, presence. But also with all of the Nordic states now as part of NATO, it gives us access through the high north to the Arctic, which is becoming more and more a, a area, a cockpit, if you will, of great power competition among the United States, Russia, and China. I think that's very important. They bring enormous military capability to the alliance. I mentioned Finland's Air Force. Sweden also has uh, a, a um, very capable Air Force. Uh, Finland also has a military that's capable of mobilizing up to 285,000 troops very quickly. Uh, if they put the whole country into mobilization, it's like 900,000. Hmm. Um, they have 1,500 artillery pieces, the largest holdings of artillery in Europe. And if there's anything we've learned from war in Ukraine, it's that artillery uh, still matters. Some people are arguing that tanks maybe don't matter that much anymore, but artillery still clearly matters and the Finns uh, bring that to the table. And I would add on the economic kind of dimension of this uh, and thinking about great power competition, uh, for those who are rightly, I think, concerned about the role of Huawei and ZTE in, uh, in 5G mobile uh, telephony and the networks that sustain it, uh, having Ericsson and Nokia um, uh, be you know, headquartered in countries that are now part of NATO, probably not a bad thing uh, either. That's good. Okay, that's encouraging. So the diplomatic efforts and, and mostly reaction to Putin has combined. And the Biden administration probably deserves some credit for this. I mean, they by, by being pro-NATO beforehand and sort of not walking away from NATO, right? And, and then, of course, mobilizing, to, helping mobilize NATO after the invasion. Uh, sort of making data more of a live thing than it certainly seemed to be two or three years ago. So, so that, that is an interesting strategic uh, shift. Now, I, look, I give great credit to Secretary Blinken um, for his work. He's been peripatetic in maintaining the alliance and uh, talking with allies. Secretary Austin to a, a degree as well in orchestrating the uh, Ukraine defense contact group that's been trying to coordinate all the military assistance uh, to Ukraine. He just uh, had a meeting in, in Europe uh, of that group uh, in anticipation of the summit. Um, so I think they've done a very good job of uh, kind of working working the alliance. Um, and I think that's you know to their credit. I just wish that they were moving faster uh, and with more energy on you know the supply front to make the decisions so that the Defense Department can move the equipment. Two other points uh, quickly, perhaps on the administration, I'm curious for your judgment. Uh, you worked in the White House. You, you've been at many meetings as representing State Department and Defense Department uh, and the White House at the deputies level and sat in on the highest levels. I mean, one 
challenge, I think, in these circumstances is to get the whole government doing things and to do things that aren't quite immediate, you know, getting weapons to Ukraine's immediate, uh, working, you know, being on the phone with uh, the UK and Germany and so forth is, is immediate. I'm struck, maybe I'm wrong about this, but it just feels to me like they, they've sort of dropped the ball, though, on energy policy, trade policy, things that are not quite directly about the war this month. But surely, if you want to think about what things will look like, and we'll get to this at the end, uh, in October or December, you want to it would have been good to have had an energy policy beginning last December, both in terms of our own production and also perhaps being able to help the Europeans more to resist the pressure Russia will put on as winter comes in Europe and Europe remains very dependent on, on Russian natural gas. Uh, I think it's a little insane to have trade tariffs on EU, friendly EU nations that are, we're working with very closely in this war and we're, then we've, Trump decided to sanction them kind of, you know, they're steel and aluminum and those sanctions haven't been lifted. I, I do feel like they're, do you feel like they just haven't focused or they're a little timid or, or they're not meetings where they have the energy department and the commerce department represented as well as state and defense? And, you know, I, uh, what's your I sense of that? I think disconnect, Bill. It's a little hard to explain. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I think some of it may be that, you know, not everybody still is working in person. There's still a lot of people remote uh, because of COVID and, and, um, there are some things that I think are very hard to explain, you know, um, you know, there on the sanctions front, for instance, you know, there was a discussion a few weeks ago about whether or not to sanction uh, Alina Kabayeva, who was reputedly Putin's mistress, uh, you know, a, a Russian uh, Olympic rhythmic gymnast who uh, was living for the most part in Switzerland. The EU sanctioned her, but we hadn't sanctioned her. And the argument, according to press reports, was even though they had sanctioned Putin's daughters, that sanctioning his mistress was somehow a bridge too far. That was going to provoke Putin, um, which goes back to this issue of, you know, excessive, I think, concern about what might provoke Putin. But it also suggests some of the disconnect you're talking about. There are press reports even today that the administration has a, a measure to fight inflation and high uh, gas prices at the pump is talking about an export ban of, of U.S., Oil. I mean, how you square that with the you know filling the needs of uh, our European allies uh, as the Russians reduce you know oil and gas deliveries? You know, I I just don't understand. Uh, so yeah, some of it seems to be, yeah, some of it might be risk averse but aversion. So it just seems to be they're, they're not thinking about the war as a big comprehensive thing, but more as a defense department, State Department thing, which obviously are two very important parts of it. But, you know, we sort of like not mobilizing the industrial base in World War II and just, you know, but let's, you know, let's make sure the army's in good shape and, you know, and let's have you know good discussions with Churchill. But I mean, you do need, and I just, I find the energy and trade part of it uh, pretty well, mystifying. And, you know, look, I, I, and I give the Department of Defense credit. I think Kath Hicks, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, has, for instance, been very focused on the question of uh, munition stocks and U.S. munition stocks being drawn down very heavily. You know, we've used something like more than a third of our Javelin stocks, I think something like half of our Stinger stocks. And um, and it may be even more at this point and, you know, approaching levels where we have to maintain some reserve for our own forces. And yet actually accelerating the production of munitions is not nearly as easy as people think because we are re really have limitations in the defense industrial base, in part because the defense industrial base has shrunk so much over uh, over the years. And uh, there's a, a kind of competition for, for uh, floor space uh, to produce these things in the factories. But there's even bigger problem with the workforce. There's insufficient workforce to, to, to make these things. And, uh, you know, we think of these products as industrial products. They are industrial products, but there's kind of an artisanal component to them as well. You need a highly trained workforce to, to make these munitions. And one of the longer term issues I think we're going to have to face is uh, how can we um, work uh, with our allies uh, together to you know, really increase the stock of precision munitions that as an alliance we dispose of. You know, and, and some of this is going to be going to the increased defense spending that European allies have uh, announced in in a lot of cases, like the Germans and others, 
Um, and some of it will be industrial cooperation across the Atlantic, which is probably a good thing for the alliance. Uh, because and, and some of it, for instance, Finland and Sweden both bring to bear uh, pretty significant defense industrial uh, capability, including um, you know some factories that they own here in the United States in some instances. So um, you know that's going to be a major undertaking. Department of Defense is, I think, on top of it. But I think you're right. There, there, you know, sort of. I think the State Department, and Defense Department, understand that this is a huge deal. But you know, the president still hasn't really always made comments, you know, uh, to the press. It's not like he hasn't said anything about the war. Um, he hasn't really, for instance, made an Oval Office address yeah. to the nation explaining what the stakes are, why we care about this, why is this important. Uh, and in the light of some of Putin's recent comments, in which he suggests that he's like Peter the Great and that what he's merely doing is taking back what is Russia's, which clearly implies potential threats against NATO members. Uh, you know, I think it, it really is incumbent on the president to spell out for the American public why this is so important, particularly if you're worried about waning attention, you know, Ukraine fatigue, all of those things that people talk about that will make it harder to sustain support for Ukraine if we settle into a long war of attrition. I want to close by getting to that sort of where we'll be in October, kind of, could it be, you know, where would might we be in a, a longer war and sort of both the you know, hopeful and less hopeful scenarios. But since you raised, uh, I think, very helpfully and sort of a question of the administration, both generally, but also the president personally, I mean, we have, because you've been in government so much and dealt with a million summits and preparations for them and trips, you know, we actually have two things coming up that could be fairly important, I suppose, in the sense of both what they'll tell us about what the Biden administration is doing and how they're working with allies, but also uh, whether they an impression of success strengthens the administration's hand here at home or not. I've always thought that's a key part of these foreign trips, actually, is a kind of voters think, OK, well, they kind of know what they're doing, and that seems like a reasonable thing, and so we're OK with that. Or obviously, if something goes badly, the opposite. So we have this NATO summit, which is we're speaking on, what, Tuesday? The uh, Wednesday, I don't know what we are on a Wednesday, the 22nd, and that's, that's exactly a week from now, I think eight days from now in, in Madrid. And then a trip to the Middle East scheduled for just two weeks after that to Israel and Saudi Arabia, uh, where he will ask the Saudis to, President Will, to increase their oil production. Uh, so why, why we're doing that instead of increasing our own, but whatever. Um, I'm just curious what you, as someone who's been in the run up to these summits and meetings so often, what do you think? Are you sort of hopeful that we, if we got together a month from now, we'd think, okay, that went pretty well, and we're we're pretty good shape in terms of our alliances and reputation around the world. We haven't sent a signal of weakness. We've sent a signal of strength. Or are you worried about these two, or what combination? Well, I hope. I mean, I certainly hope that they're successful. I want the president uh, to succeed in in both of these. He has said repeatedly since he took office that in the wake of the Trump presidency, that the United States was back under his leadership that it was taking its position at the head of the table of our alliances, including the NATO alliance. Uh, he's now got to step up and, and uh, prove that point uh, in, a, in a NATO summit where it's going to require some, uh, I think, involvement of the president personally. So as I said, I think he's going to have to personally resolve this issue of Finnish and Swedish membership. I mean, if we come out of the summit and- I mean, I've read other people saying, well, what the- They'll work it out with the Turks. We don't want to be the big, you know, the, yeah. whatever, the heavy handed, uh, you know, great power here. But you don't think that that happened. We need to we need to make uh, it happen. Right. Look, the Finns and Swedes can do you know, some things. First of all, it's a complete pretext. I mean, it is it's clearly not the real reason Erdogan is is right. doing this. If it were, he would have raised the objection when Ninista and Anderson called him in the early part of April. He didn't, he waited, and you know this is clearly a pretext. So it, it's gotta be, and part of it, I think, is that he wants FaceTime, which he hasn't had with Biden, uh, you know, with Biden. So Biden is gonna have to get his hands dirty uh, as his predecessor, Barack Obama, did when Erdogan objected at the Strasbourg summit at the beginning of, of uh, Biden, I mean, uh, excuse me, of Obama's presidency uh, in 2009 to um, Anders Fogh Rasmussen as Secretary General of NATO because of the you know five year earlier Yulin's post in Mohammed Khartoum's controversy. Again, it was clearly a pretext. 
uh, you know, Obama talks about it in his memoirs. In the end, Erdogan settled for having a Turkish deputy uh, secretary general of NATO uh, and a, a couple of general officer billets in the integrated military staff. Um, you know, Biden's going to have to do that. Um, the uh, strategic new strategic concept is going to be very, very important. He's going to have to show that he can endorse that and that he can um, you know, make it relevant to the American public. So yeah, he's going to have to play a big role. And if the administration thinks that they can sit back, uh, you know, look, if, if we get in and out of this summit and Erdogan is still holding up Sweden and Finland, it's not going to be seen as a successful summit. And that will, you know, not be, you know, won't redound to Biden's credit or benefit. Um, the other summit you mentioned is equally important. I think it is an opportunity for the administration to perhaps undo some damage, uh, you know, that it did. They came in very critical of uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis. Um, they uh, took some steps, I think, in their own mind to facilitate uh, the reentry of the United States into the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran, the nuclear deal with Iran that was uh, agreed to in 2015 and then which President Trump pulled out of in 2019. And uh, I think they uh, thought that, for instance, by de-designating the Houthis, a, a uh, Iranian proxy uh, group in Yemen, that they would uh, help open the way towards uh, a renegotiated agreement. That hasn't happened, but their uh, tone deafness to the attacks which the Houthis launched on Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, I think, came back to haunt them because when they asked when President Biden tried to call MBS um, and uh, the head of the UAE, um, Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, he couldn't get his phone calls returned. But that really had to do, now you can argue, and I think I would argue that that was not great behavior by our, our partners, our you know, uh, Gulf Arab partners, but it's also not completely, um, you know, out of the norm, I would say, in international affairs. And so this is an opportunity actually to reset the relationship uh, with the Saudis. Does that mean turning a blind eye, you know, either to the show killing or to other human rights violations in Saudi Arabia? I don't think so. Uh, I, I think those issues have to be addressed as well. But It'll I think be tricky, don't you think? I mean, it's hard to go somewhere, raise those issues, not raise them too much. I just think he's, I'm, I'm not even criticizing the trip, though I'm a little uncertain what feels like there's more downside than upside, frankly, but um, and he's going to Israel, which now is going to have, you know, elections in three months, but um, maybe he could find some excuse to postpone it. But I am a little worried that the net effect of these two trips, and you've been there, so for these kinds of things, you know, it can, it can damage your standing at a moment when we really need to look strong and in, in command, right? I think the key to that trip is going to be to, to place it in a strategic context as part of our over, overall uh, effort to deal with Iran. I mean, uh, the negotiations over the JCPOA have not gone well. The Iranians are moving towards uh, becoming a threshold nuclear power. That's having repercussions uh, throughout the region. People want to know what the administration is going to do about it. The administration in testimony on, uh, before Congress has said there's no alternative to diplomacy. Um, but if the diplomacy is failing, that does, as Senator Menendez, this is not just crazy neocon Republicans like you and me, but, um, you know, this is, uh, Senator Menendez has said, what's your plan B? Uh, and this has got to be part of plan B, which is, uh, a strategic approach to dealing with Iran. I think people will understand the need to make certain kinds of accommodations, even if they're, you know, perhaps a little unseemly. Uh, if it's in service of a very important strategic objective, which in this case is uh, trying to contain and, and uh, deal with a Iran that's trying to assert its mastery of the region. Uh, we've seen just in the last week episodes of uh, Iranian boats buzzing uh, U.S. ships uh, in the Gulf. Uh, so this is potentially very dangerous. He's got to put it in strategic context. He's also going to have to very carefully negotiate, you know, navigate, I should say, those human rights issues. And I don't think the answer is that you go silent about it. 
I, I think the answer is the reality is MBS is there for the duration. And to the degree we want human rights, you know, in um, to be honored in, in Saudi Arabia in ways they haven't been in the past, we're going to have to persuade him and push him and nudge him, you know, in the right direction. Um, and that, I think, has always been the reality there. Um, and I, given the importance of the region, um, as we've rediscovered, uh, despite our own energy self-sufficiency, um, you know, Middle East oil still matters because it's sensitive to price. Um, and in, in this instance, our allies rely on it. Those have been the two uh, things that have made it important, you know, for, for going back to the Marshall Plan in the late 1940s. So this is, you know, something that, uh, again, the president's going to have to show leadership and have to show some kind of strategic direction and hopefully reverse the perception in the region, which um, was already strong before uh, last summer, but after the Afghan disastrous Afghan withdrawal uh, really took hold, which was that the United States was walking away from, from the region. He's gonna have to reverse that perception. And I hope, well, I expect senior people in the Biden administration will watch this conversation, I hope they, Take what you're saying to heart. I can imagine the all the instincts that why some of the political advisors and stuff. We oh great, now we're going to raise another confrontation with Iran. We're in the middle of a very difficult situation in Ukraine, which is partly contributing to gas prices being over five dollars. And why don't we just go and get some concession on gas and get out of there? You know. And, but I, I tend to agree with you. If, if if he looks like he's not being serious about all the threats in a sense, then it's hard to be serious about you know just one. I mean, obviously Ukraine comes first right now, but. Um, it is a, but it's an opportunity also to really lay out a kind of, you know, uh, revive U.S. strength around the world. Lots of allies, lots of people willing to work with us. That's good news. Um, lots of weakness in our adversaries, actually. But uh, yeah, whether he takes that opportunity will be interesting. Well, and look, uh, they were slow, I think, to pick up on the importance of the Abraham Accords. God knows I have had plenty of criticisms in our conversations over the last four years of the Trump administration. But the Abraham Accords really were, uh, you know, a, a major achievement, and they were an achievement that validated years and years of bipartisan U.S. policy, which was to try to get Israel's Arab neighbors to recognize Israel and to establish relations with Israel and be willing, in this instance, to work with Israel against a common strategic threat, which is Iran. Um, and I think the administration was slow to pick up on that, but I think they have realized that now. Hopefully, during this visit, they'll be able to. To, to build on what their predecessors uh, accomplished in this in this particular uh, area. Anyway, interesting to have these two summits both sort of fairly close to each other and 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 in the midst of this you know very difficult uh, fight point, against Putin. To your point, Bill, about the um, tendency to want to say that uh, we really don't need a confrontation with Iran now. We're at this war in Ukraine. It's already you know taking up enough bandwidth. You know, at one level, that's sort of an understandable reaction. One hopes they would have learned from their approach to Putin in the spring of 2021, when there was a lot of talk about we're going to park the Russia problem so we can concentrate on the real strategic challenge, which is China. That's not to gainsay the notion that China is the long term strategic challenge we face, but you don't get to choose if you're the United States, you know, sort of which major national interest you're going to vindicate. You have to be prepared to deal with all of them. And, you know, the, as we used to say in the Pentagon when I was there, the enemy gets a vote. You don't necessarily get to decide, you know, when and where you're going to have to deal with these problems. And you don't get to pull out of Afghanistan suddenly and without, co uh, co you know, uh, much notice or cooperation with your NATO allies and with pretty uh, bad results, frankly, and, and in a very um, bad way. And you don't get to say, well, that's only don't look at that that's just one little part of the world and it was a very long war and very difficult and endless war but doesn't mean that we have doesn't say anything about our resolution elsewhere and i mean i don't think that's why putin invaded reinvaded ukraine he had when he was laying the stage uh, for, uh, you know laying the predicate for that and that's been on his mind for a long time but it uh it didn't help it's to the administration's credit that they kind of were able to recover and, and and pull everyone together. And I think, in fact, it's done a lot of good. I mean, this is not the reason to do it, but it, it's done a lot of, uh, it's repaired some of the damage to Afghanistan because we've looked resolute and, and capable in helping to organize the, uh, helping the Ukrainians. But 
these things are so interrelated. That's one thing I always uh, learned a little bit when I was in government. And then after also uh, uh, one meeting with the foreign leader, I remember who raised something that had happened thousands of miles away, not his part of the world at all. And as you say, in the American foreign policy establishment, well, that's not relevant to this because this is the Middle East and this is East Asia in this case. But no, he was watching carefully and was very worried about something that uh, this is the Syrian red line. And so uh, failure to enforce that. So yeah, I think it's, uh, I think the image, I think Joe Biden presumably understands this. And obviously Tony Blinken knows this intellectually and Jake Sullivan. But of course, when you're in government, there's such a temptation and it's understandable to, bracket things and put off things and hope that things will go on your timetable <laughs> and uh, you get to do one thing at a time, so to speak. And, but yeah, it'll be an interesting, I think we'll know a little more in a month about sort of the administration's overall willingness to say, we have real strategic threats and Ukraine's one of them and it's the central one, but we can't sort of just bracket everything else for now. And also we need to more fundamentally, and let's get to this now, if you, if you want to try to do a little more so that in October, Ukraine's winning, not just in a frozen conflict or or losing gradually. And Putin's not stronger, he's weaker. And Europeans aren't more inclined, they're less inclined to compromise and weaken the sanctions because of threats of, 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 of gas uh, cutoffs in, in the winter and so forth. I mean, I guess just you know, talk about that a little bit. I mean, what, what do you expect for, what, will it look, what could it look like in October? How hopeful are you that it will be on the sort of a plus side of this set of equations, not on the negative side? I mean, well, my, my concern, as I've said earlier, is that we're not paying sufficient attention to the economic side of this. Uh, there's still, you know, plenty of money on the um, out of the 40 billion uh, to draw down on for defense needs for Ukraine, although, as we've discussed, I'd like to see more and faster um, as they you know, parcel this out. Um, that having been said, at the current burn rate, you know, the economic assistance part of this for Ukraine will be pretty much, ex you know, uh, have expired by October. We'll be out of, uh, out of Schlitz at that point on the economic side. And, you know, I worry. I don't, you know, first of all, Congress is going to be in recess, so you're not going to get, you know, uh, and I'm not sure you're going to get, even when the Congress comes back, another $40 billion aid package. A lot will depend on the of course, the composition of that Congress, you already saw 11 senators and I think 67 uh, House members on the Republican side vote against the, um, the $40 billion package. So it's hard to imagine another big package, uh, which raises the question of how collectively will we and our NATO allies in Europe sustain the Ukrainians uh, in a long attritional fight? And I, I worry about that. I mean, I don't have an answer myself right now, but uh, I hope that the administration is really working overtime on trying to figure out uh, where, you know, where they're going to be, you know, in, uh, in, in October. Uh, How about the Europeans sustaining their own willingness to fight, which to be fair to them, they are under the gun in terms of energy supplies and, and winter will be coming and, and we haven't done that much to probably help them get out from under the gun. They probably could have done more themselves, like not close nuclear plants in Germany and stuff. But do you, how, I feel like they're more serious than they sometimes have been in the past, but maybe not quite willing to. But, but I still worry that, you know, politicians in some of those countries more than others are going to say, oof, can't do this forever. Can't have these sanctions forever. Russia's not going away. We gotta, we've got to begin to lessen some of the sanctions in return for reliable gas or whatever it would be. Uh, you already see that, um, you know, uh, sentiment being expressed by, you know, for instance, uh, Chancellor Schultz's uh, foreign policy advisor. Uh, you know, we, we need to stop focusing on the military balance. We need to focus on the long-term, you know, European relationship with Russia, you know, as if this is a normal regime with whom right. we you can do normal business. Um, there's just been in general, I think, in many quarters in Germany, an unwillingness to look back uh, at the ways in which, Germ in particular, German decisions have been catastrophic in making uh, Europe dependent on uh, Russian energy, for, for instance. Uh, there was a scathing column recently in the Financial Times by Constanze Stelzenmuller, who is a is at the Brookings Institution about the lack of introspection among German leaders, including Angela Merkel, for having taken uh, these decisions, notably including 
you know, closing down all of Germany's nuclear power plants. I mean, they're now firing up coal plants in order to make up for the, you know, Russian gas that they made themselves dependent on. Um, and then, of course, they're going to say, oh, my God, this is terrible for, for the climate. Well, the French understood that, and that's why the French, you know, have basically a plutonium economy and are, get most of their energy from, from nuclear. Um, so I, there, I do worry uh, that, you know, we're going to start to see some fissures among the Europeans. I think uh, it will be both military and um, and economic. So, I mean, there will be, as cold weather starts to approach, as you say, winter is coming, when people start talking about gas rationing or other methods that they're going to have to uh, apply in order to get through the winter. I mean, let's hope for a mild winter. Um, but, but that will start to chip away at resolve and uh, more pressure on Ukraine to you know, reach some kind of one-sided bad deal with the Russians, which I'm not even sure the Russians are interested in, by the way. I mean, they might you can pressure the Ukrainians all you want, but if the Russians are not willing to, you know, to negotiate, and so far there's been zero evidence, I think, that they are, um, or serious interest anyway. Um, so there, there is that. And I think you're also going to see on the military side some fatigue about supplying the Ukrainians with, with equipment. And at the NATO summit, there's a danger that, you know, the frontline states are going to want to see much more serious uh, effort on it, what is called NATO's enhanced uh, forward presence, more permanent stationing of forces, or at least more infrastructure training facilities being constructed, more rotation, filling out the five core headquarters to make it uh, actually much easier for five core to fall in on it and actually move quickly uh, to offset some of these time space dilemmas I mentioned uh, for defending the Balkan, I mean the Baltics, excuse me. Um, I think you'll see some divisions over that too, because I think Western Europeans would say, well, you know, the Russian performance, military performance is so bad. We don't really have to worry about all this without understanding the difference in the nature of the terrain and the potential danger that exposes some of the NATO frontline uh, states to. You're seeing this play out, by the way, in sort of miniature in the uh, confrontation between Lithuania and Russia over Lithuania's enforcement of the EU sanctions, saying you can't transit, you know, sanctioned uh, people or material uh, by rail through Lithuania to Kaliningrad, the Russian exclave located between Poland and, and Lithuania. And that um, Russians are very angry about that. They say they don't care about sanctions, but obviously they do because they're making a huge fuss about this making all kinds of threats about severe uh, uh, responses by Russia. Uh, Nikolai Petrushev, the head of the Security Council, very close advisor of Putin's, former head of the FSB, uh, you know, was saying that they were going to take decisions that would make life very uncomfortable for the Lithuanians. We don't know what that means, but uh, Lithuania, unlike Ukraine, actually is a member of NATO and has an Article 5 uh, you know, guarantee. So if people, if Russia, for instance, were to impose a naval blockade, which is an act of war, as we've discussed, you know, that puts the cats among the pigeons in terms of your, uh, you know, Russia-NATO escalation issue. So, um, you know, this is um, going to be a, an ongoing drama in multiple acts. Yeah, and what I take from this, I think this is a very useful way to close in a ways. You know, there's a certain sentiment here, we done pretty well with Ukraine. They're really admirable. They're hanging in. Hopefully they'll do better, not worse, but either way, it's not the disaster. It looked like it might be in the first 72 hours. And, you know, let's go back to focusing on gas prices and the domestic issues, which many of which are just awfully important. And obviously some are really important, January 6th. I mean, there's just a lot going on here. And I do worry that, and that we have election campaigns coming up. Your point about the Republicans, who've been pretty good, and in my point of view, our point of view, and pretty bipartisan, honestly, on, on Ukraine, not too many cheap shots, I don't think. Uh, but Katie Britt, who won the Alabama Senate primary yesterday, and who was the establishment candidate, she's Shelby, she was Shelby, she was staff against Mo Brooks. So that was kind of the McConnell wing defeating the, the MAGA wing, if you want. But even she, to cater to the primary voters, at least, or maybe she believes it, was critical of the Ukraine aid package. So that does show, tell me a little bit that, you know, it's not going to be that easy to maintain, let's call it the McConnell, more responsible side of it against MAGA 
momentum. A lot would depend on who wins and who loses, obviously, in November. And whether Trump personally gets involved in this issue or not, which he hasn't really been so um, too much. Uh, but um, yeah, this, I mean, anyway, what, what, what all this tells me is the notion that we're over the hump or we've had the real crisis and now it's going to be a little bit of a downhill. I mean, if you think about the world and the challenges we'll face just in terms of Ukraine, and then you add Iran and so forth. Uh, it's sort of, we were through the first act of this five act play, but awful lot of challenges ahead really for the, for the, for us as a country, but for the Biden administration, I suppose, in particular. You know, I, the way I would put it is I'm not sure about what you took from, you know, your experience in government, but what I, took from it was after 30 years of watching this up close and personal, as they say, um, I think the national security establishment can handle about one and a half big things at a time. <laughs> I think we underestimate, you know, the bandwidth limitations that, that the principals have. I mean, there's just so many hours in the day, uh, it's very difficult for, for the government to handle more than one and a half big things. And we're now unfortunately challenged, I mean, it, in the Cold War, when there was just one big thing, that was you know, relatively manageable. Um, but now facing Russia, China, um, the challenges we face in the Middle East, North Korea, uh, it's extremely difficult, I think, for the government, no matter who's in charge, uh, to try and manage all of that um, you know, in, in an effective way. So we really have our work cut out for us. And we don't have, unlike in the Cold War, neither political party, and I would say neither even intellectual movement almost, has spent years or decades uh, building a kind of human infrastructure, you might say, of people who come in well-prepared. I'm not being critical of the by it's just the way it's been for the last 15 years, certainly, well, really 12, well, yeah, I guess the Obama years and the Trump years, I mean, Bush was more complicated, you know, obviously, a uh, huge ramp up to deal with post 9-11, but that was somewhat focused on that. I mean, we just don't have the kind of uh, yeah. people, you know, just on that same situation where when you had a turnover, a new administration in the Cold War, there was a lot of turmoil and all this, but a heck of a lot of people coming in who knew their counterparts abroad, who had worked on these issues before, who had worked with each other, had worked with people in the in defense and in industry and in, you know, parts of civil society and so forth. And there's some of that, but it's, I, I think that's also, you know, a bit of a, and it's hard to ask the Biden administration to fix that overnight. You can't fix it overnight, but they're playing with a little bit of a weaker hand, even to start with. Right. Well, we, we have a human capital problem in national security and some of it, you know, stems from the fact that despite the, you know, the major think tank presence we have in DC and, and all of that, and the reality is, so for instance, the philanthropic se sector has been disinvesting since the end of the Cold War in international affairs. You know, if you look at the money that's being provided uh, by you know, Ford or Rockefeller Foundation, you know, Arthur, et cetera, all of this has just declined dramatically. Some of the major foundations uh, during the Cold War that uh, funded uh, efforts in it, say, like the Olin Foundation, for instance, which was a major player during the Cold War, completely out of business. Um, and, uh, you know, that's got downstream consequences, as, as you say, um, in the foreign service, just for example, uh, a lot of us, uh, during the cold war cut our teeth on, you know, learning Russian and uh, studying Soviet affairs. That, that was the front line of the cold war. Everybody wanted to be involved in that when I entered the foreign service in 1980. Um, and, uh, you know, after the cold war ended, you no, know, again, we kind of disinvested in that. And now we have a shortage. Of, of capable Russian speakers. I wish I could tell you that we've made up for it with, you know, a real, uh, very capable cohort of Mandarin speakers, but we haven't even really done that. Yeah. So, um, you know, some of what we did, uh, Bob Gates, when I worked for him, we, we used to joke about the fact that he and Condi Rice and I were all beneficiaries of Sputnik and the National Defense Educational Act in 1957. Um, we haven't had anything like that since right. the end of the Cold War, and uh, there there are downstream consequences. Yeah, and maybe you know Ukraine actually one effect might be a sort of a Sweden Finland type situation where people realize that the world is dangerous. And we need to have similar investments, similar restructuring uh, expenditures. You know, of, of analogous to what happened at the end of the '40s and then in the mid '50s to get us ready for this uh, new world that they then faced. And that we now face was very much the case when I came to Washington, I worked in domestic policy, but the prestigious thing to work in was foreign policy. And even and I, I mean, I was happy to work at the education department, but, you know, the really 
important stuff seemed to be in the foreign policy sphere. And when I became chief of staff to the vice president of the White House, that was, you know, we all kind of focused more on that. And and uh, and young people coming to the work on the Hill, a lot of very able people obviously came and focused on different aspects of national security. And I just think the incentives for the last, uh, with this sort of the exception of 9-11 and the few years after that, the incentives have been so much the other way. And then and, and it's not just the the more uh, the people you, you read about uh, the most who you know are kind of just performative and don't care about anything but even the more sober people and serious people you know they the, the incentives have been to be sober and serious about a lot of other issues and not so much to focus on on national security so i think in that that's a bigger challenge we should talk about some time for the country as a whole but uh, but it will be affected by how we deal with the short term right these things are not separate either it's just you know if if we deal pretty well in the short term that it's makes a lot more people think, okay, this is important and and the real challenge. And if you sort of duck it, seem to be ducking it and avoiding it, everyone just decides, well, there's no real incentive in either party to kind of get, you know, handle these problems as they come up. We're not going to really think strategically. And so I do think this is a very important moment, actually, not just Ukraine's awfully important, but it's not just about Ukraine. I mean, what I worry about is it, it, the point you make is, is, I think, very important because what I worry about is that people start to think, this is just not worth the trouble. Yeah. It's just it's just too hard. And I think what that does is essentially uh, strengthen the isolationist tendencies that exist in both parties. I mean, we've talked about the Republicans, Democrats have their own, you know, uh, nation building at home problem. Um, and uh, what then I think will happen is, you know, we'll turn away from trying to man actively manage these problems and only be forced back to address them when they become so dangerous and so difficult that the cost of managing them will be way higher uh, than even the difficulties we face now. Let's hope that that is not the case and that this warning is, uh, and many other similar warnings are heard. And let's hope mostly that we obviously do as a country do a good job for the next uh, six, 12 months. It's awfully important, but Tom, I do think you know, Putin has really raised the stakes in a way, uh, uh, not just for the brave Ukrainians, obviously, and all the incredible the savagery of the war there, but in terms of really making clear kind of what's at stake in terms of having a you know American leadership and a real and a world order that's okay at least and acceptable and deters these kinds of things or doesn't, right? I mean it really is a moment for people to be to be serious. So uh Eric, thank you so much for joining me today for a serious and sober, but I hope not entirely, but not depressing really, I think. I hope conversation. Uh so we'll we'll do it again in a few months and see where we stand. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Bill. Uh, thanks, Eric. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.